Hello. Hopefully this, uh, this fixes it. Ah. All right, here's the uh, the moment of truth. Events. Uh, he had he had been sort of brazen. He, you know, he's supposed to meet with regulators, and then he he posts pictures of himself on Twitter with Instagram models going to Las Vegas. I mean, he was just doing brazen uh, defiance of regulatory authority. And then Arizona got. Him. Um, he'd ultimately find uh, the police would would get him as well out of California. Uh, but then Arizona got him. I thought that was going to be the end of him. On September 27th, 2016, the Securities Division of the Arizona Corporate Commission filed its temporary order to cease and desist a notice of opportunity for hearing against Jacob Wall and his partner, Matthew Johnson, barring them from activities in the state. The Arizona Corporate Commission's investigation began after David Diedrich, the same man who sparked the NFA investigation, filed a complaint. This would be the last time that David Diedrich would file a complaint against Jacob Wall. He later committed suicide. How much it had to do with being defrauded by Jacob Wall is unknown. Sure, yeah, so Arizona investigates him for uh, security sales. He ends up, I believe, pleading out or you know, essentially cutting a deal where he's gonna owe tens of thousands of dollars that he still years later hasn't paid back. Um, you know, it, the most interesting one comes in, um, I believe 2019, when Jacob is indicted in uh, California. Uh, for unlawful security sales over this, this really kind of tortured story of a guy who, an adult who seemingly kind of bought into Jacob's hype and lent him tens of thousands of dollars or, or invested this money through Jacob. And it basically turned out it was, it was all a con, you know, according to the um, according to the charging documents. And this guy is like, oh crap, you know, I need to get my money back. And then Jacob, the money has disappeared. And so this guy ends up killing himself. Um, and so Jacob has been charged in that case. The Arizona Corporate Commission's filing named four investors who were victims of Jacob's alleged fraud, false or deceptive claims, and bad acts. David Diedrich was the only investor with a given name on the filing. The rest are referred to as Investor 2, 3, and 4. Investor 2 gave Jacob and NEX Capital a $20,000 check in early December 2015, but stopped payment of the check she had tendered to NEX Capital a month later when she suspected foul play. Investor 3, like Diedrich, contacted Jacob in March 2015 after seeing him on television. Investor 3 gave Jacob $5,000 to invest after being led to believe that he would receive a high rate of return if he invested. By January 2015, Jacob only returned a check worth nearly $3,000. Probably not. Uh, when Jessa. Investor 4 contacted Jacob on July 18, 2016, I mean, he could be sued for wrongful death, but it, it'd be such a, it'd be a very, very, very difficult uh, thing for the prosecution or the, not prosecution, the uh, the plaintiffs to show causation. He could have been a, a uh, what he did could have been a, a serious factor, but they would need to show like causation. 16, she had just received an inheritance of $100,000. She found a Craigslist ad for Jacob's house flipping investment firm called Montgomery Assets, which Jacob started to focus his attention on after being banned from trading derivatives. On the phone, Jacob told her, quote, Montgomery Assets is quite a large firm, not ultra large. It's not Goldman Sachs. It's not Wells Fargo, but you know, it's got a nice solid team. He told her that the firm had 30 years of experience and had been around for a while despite the fact that he made the company only a few months prior. Additionally, Wall was only 18 years old at the time, and his partner Matthew Johnson, 27 years old. Perhaps sensing that the investment promises Jacob Wall was making were too good to be true, Investor 4 never sent him a check. The Arizona Corporation Commission charged him and his companies with 14 counts of securities fraud. The commission found that neither Wall nor his companies were licensed as a broker and therefore were not permitted to provide investment advice or register to offer and sell securities in Arizona. 
Additionally, they found that Jacob Wall repeatedly misrepresented the size of his companies and the risk associated with investments. Jacob Wall consented to fines and penalties assessed by the Arizona Corporation Commission later that year. Now, he could have went to prison for securities fraud if he didn't agree to file a consent decree. Instead, he was only fined. However, to this date, Jacob Wall still hasn't paid his fines. The ACC is now working with the Arizona Attorney General's office to pursue collection efforts against Jacob Wall. On October 23, 2017, the ACC held an open meeting in which the board questioned Jacob Wall's lawyers about the outstanding payments and if Wall would ever pay his fines. Can I make one comment? Um, Before you do, okay. Commissioner Dunn, are you comfortable with that? No, I, I think we should ask the um, counsel here that uh, that his client is willing to agree to this. I, I'm wrestling with this too. If there's been a second default of payment on this, I'm wondering why we're going through this exercise and why you think your client is going to be able to make payment just on a later date if he, he's not able to make the payment today. Uh, I do not believe that there was an, an original default. Well, in July 2016, Jacob Wall was contacted by undercover authorities posing as a real estate agent and as Wait. a client who wanted to invest money. After multiple conversations, Jacob Wall asked them to invest $100,000 with his house flipping company, Montgomery Assets, and guaranteed a 17% return of investment. Three years later, on August 19, 2019, a warrant was issued by the Riverside County DA's office for Jacob Ball's arrest for one count of violating the California Corporation's code by selling an unregistered security. That same day, Jacob was taken into custody. He pleaded not guilty and is currently awaiting a settlement hearing, which has been postponed due to COVID-19. Jacob's dad, David Wall, said, The district attorney never bothered to talk to Jacob. If they did, I don't believe the case would have been filed. I'm very disappointed given my 30 years of experience with that office. Jacob has zero criminal history and was shocked by this as well. According to David Wall, oh Jacob learned about the warrant for his arrest through the media. Okay, last but not least, Jacob Wall was investigated by the SEC. Jacob Wall was the subject of a year-long <laughs> investigation by the United States Security and Exchange Commission. Oh my God. The SEC concluded that they found no grounds for enforcement action. However, Victoria Levin, an assistant regional director in the SEC's enforcement division, stated that their conclusion must in no way be construed as indicating that the party has been exonerated or that no action may ultimately result from the staff's investigation. Lame. In an email, Jacob Wall told Benzinga.com that, quote, I know very well I have never done anything illegal or immoral. <laughs> so he just lied right there. <laughs> You serious? Before I talk about how Jacob Wall pivoted from a life of petty financial fraud into becoming a political smear merchant, I'd like to introduce you to his partner, Jack Berkman. Here we go. Answers, for example, firing off in power grid, our former Clinton White House staffer, David Goodfriend, and Jack Berkman, the attorney at J.M. Berkman and Associates, and you know how it works, guys. 20 seconds to make your case, and then we go at it after that. Jack, you probably don't even need 20 seconds to tell us why you don't think it should be expanded. <laughs> Jack Berkman was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Strangely, he has not publicly disclosed his exact birthday, but he was likely born in either 1965 or 1966. After graduating from Georgetown with a law degree, he enjoyed quite an accomplished professional career beginning in the 1990s. He worked for Rick Lazio, a New York congressman, as his legislative counsel. Following that, he worked as a lobbyist and later joined the prestigious firm Holland & Knight. After that, he started his own lobbying firm, J.M. Berkman & Associates, which prospered. However, midway through the 2010s, Jack Berkman became bored with lobbying. For some reason, he decided that what he really wanted was media attention at any Thank cost. you, Joshua Lee, for the $10. In 2014, he gained the attention he desired by saying he wanted openly gay football players banned from the NFL after Michael Sam, who at the time was a college football star, announced that he was gay. Now, local lobbyist Jack Berkman plans to propose legislation banning gay athletes from joining the National Football League. Tonight, we have Jack live in the newsroom. Jack, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Good evening. Good evening. So what is this about, Jack? Some are already calling this a stunt. No, hardly a stunt. It's, it's about restoring common decency, Mike. Jack's brother James, who's gay, denounced his actions with a tweet stating that he was being an ass. Soon, Jack's campaign to ban gays from the NFL fizzled. 
But according to his brother James, he got exactly what he wanted, attention. In 2016, Jack Berkman gained media attention again by inserting himself in Seth Rich's murder investigation. Now to our top story, an Omaha family is grieving tonight after their son was shot. Now we're getting into less comically bad into the really, really shitty uh, stuff. So get ready. Shot and killed in Washington, D.C. over the weekend. Seth Rich was born and raised in Omaha. He worked for the Democratic National Committee in D.C. Seth Rich was a 27-year-old DNC staffer who was shot on early Sunday morning on July 10, 2016, while walking home from a bar. A police investigation suspected that he was the victim of a botched robbery, but dubious rumors spread that he was assassinated for leaking Hillary Clinton's emails. Jack Berkman offered a $130,000 reward to anyone with information about Seth Rich's murder. He posted flyers announcing the reward around the Bloomingdale neighborhood where Seth Rich was shot. He also contacted Seth Rich's family and held a press conference with them. Hi, I'm Jack Berkman. Today I want to talk to you about something very important, the murder of Seth Rich. As you may know, I have formed an independent commission to investigate this murder, but we need more information. We need to hear from you. Please check out our website, whokilledseth.com. But soon, his relationship with the family soured. They called him a publicity seeker and were especially disturbed by his decision to film a reenactment of Seth Rich's murder. Yeah. Oh. They filmed the reenactment of the want? murder in his own image. Fucking hell. Do, do, do you want something? You want my wallet? Here, have it. My phone? You want my phone too? You can have both. Have my watch too. We don't want your damn watch. We're not here for that. What do you want? You damn amateur, you exposed us. No, 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 no. I took all the necessary precautions. They can't trace you to anything. Well, Save your breath. Turn not around. Walk. What? Turn Walk. Around. You don't want to do anything. What are you Walk. doing? Walk. Yeah. Y yeah. They cut contact with him shortly after that. Jack Berkman continued to investigate the murder. He teamed up with a former Marine named Kevin Doherty to help solve the case. The two later had a falling out, and Kevin Doherty shot him twice in the ass and tried to run him over with a car. Berkman says he went to the Keybridge Marriott's parking garage to pick- So yeah, here's another crazy thing. This guy, former military guy, worked with Berkman, had a falling out, and then tried to kill Berkman. Pick up documents from someone he thought was an FBI whistleblower. But this is where things get interesting. I wasn't expecting anything bad. And, it was my and uh, bang, 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 I feel two shots in my leg. Then the police say Berkman was hit with an SUV. By some miracle, a girl who was in on the second floor there, staying there, flung open the window and screamed, and that's probably what saved my life because he then reversed course, skedaddle. Hang on, you said there's a lot of young people your age that are sort of closeted Trump supporters. Tell me about them. You're 18. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that, you know, sort of support Trump. They're not very vocal about it. And, you know, you see in this case, Cruz has this, you know, very real penchant towards lying, very Hillary-esque. He's sick, right? And he's being called out for it. <laughs> so where does a spurious crook go after being banned from training securities at the age of 19? Well, the world of online politics, where grifters with the morality of executioners tend to shine. Yep. The wave of Donald Trump spawned many online personalities bereft of any qualifications other than a Twitter account and an ability to pander to all things mega. The movement was littered with unscrupulous characters like Candace Owens, who emerged on the scene after she identified the earning potential of the Trump bandwagon, despite the fact that she ran a site doxing trolls who made offensive comments online that exact same year. It's likely that Jacob Wall witnessed the rise of people like Candace Owens and wanted a piece of the pie. It was around 2017 that Jacob Wall made this career pivot. Instead of presenting himself as a financial guru, he decided to become an online political commentator. He started live streaming on YouTube, recording a podcast, and he created a blog called The Washington Reporter. 
which branded itself as a producer of independent journalism and hard-hitting investigative reports. And it was later discovered that his website's code of ethics was directly plagiarized from ProPublica. A simple way to look at how he marketed himself at this time is just to look at his Twitter bio. His Twitter account featured a bio that read, Trumponomics expert, financial and political commentator. His banner was a photo of him posing with Donald Trump at a photo op. How did he get this? Well, his father, David Wall, was a Donald Trump surrogate, which is probably how he got the opportunity to meet the former president. Jacob grew his Twitter following by rapidly responding to all of Donald Trump's tweets with sycophantic praise. His over-the-top fawning caught the eyes of the former president. Donald Trump retweeted Jacob Wall back when it was uncharacteristic for him to do so. And I gotta say, this was very, very uncharacteristic for Donald Trump to do at the Thank time. Thank you for all he the uh, re-ups for the memberships, anybody. guys. But here he was Always appreciated. retweeting Jacob Wall. And that got him a lot of attention. So much attention that articles were written about Jacob Wall wondering who he was. It was after being retweeted by Donald Trump that Jacob declared, I will further the president's agenda at all costs, and I won't apologize for it. So uh, basically, Jacob he didn't Wall lie about that Donald one. Trump's number one bootlicker, reply guy, ass kisser. Perhaps you're not familiar with the term reply guy, but it's, uh, it's fairly self-explanatory. It's someone who constantly replies to someone else's tweets. Before Donald Trump was suspended from Twitter, there were several accounts that you'd always see in his replies. These people tended to be either Trump devotees or Trump detractors. So they'd reply to every single tweet that Donald Trump made and gain thousands of likes and thousands of followers doing so. It was an incredibly effective way to grow a brand. Perhaps their intentions were sincere, but it's clearly a strategy that many use to gain exposure. Take the Krastenstein brothers, for example. Two brothers from Florida who amassed hundreds of thousands of followers nice, by replying Sean. to every Donald Trump tweet with some variation of orange man bad. Like Jacob Wall, the Krastenstein's had a history of fraud before getting into online politics. The Department of Justice seized over $500,000 of their money and assets because they ran a Ponzi scheme and committed wire fraud. Years later, the Krasenstein brothers became lightning rods of the hashtag resistance to Donald Trump movement. And they basically used this to grow a following and make money. They made an anti-Trump children's book called How the People Trumped Ronald Plump. And they also made a website called Hill Reporter. But their success was a flash in the pan. Soon they were booted off Twitter in 2019 for operating multiple fake accounts and purchasing account interactions. Mm -hmm. Jacob Wall and the Krasensteins are two sides of the same coin. Opportunists. Opportunists with a history of fraudulent activity who benefited off of people's sincere political beliefs for personal gain. And just like Jacob Wall, the Krasensteins are just seen as a big joke. Another way that Jacob Wall gained a lot of attention online were his hipster coffee shop tweets. Basically, the premise of these tweets were that he overheard liberals in a hipster coffee shop whispering about secretly supporting Donald Trump. These tweets were so widely mocked that there's a Know Your Meme page about them. So, <laughs> so I think Jacob's kind of breakout moment on Twitter was that he would always tweet, he came up with this kind of trope where he would claim that he had heard something at a hipster coffee shop and it was kind of counterintuitive for what you might think would happen there. So it would be something like, um, and it was always like a very niche thing. It was like, I was just at a hipster coffee shop and I heard two people talking about how thrilled they are that um, Trump is pulling out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Like it, it was very specific things that like, surely you wouldn't hear this. And then he just kept tweeting it all the time. And so, you know, it kind of became a meme on Twitter. And hipster he, coffee shop, am I right? later find out with other Jacob things, he has a great skill for just keeping a straight face when he's doing, he's clearly doing an act and just clearly lying through his teeth. And he just says, oh no, no, I really heard that. It's unclear how Jack Berkman and Jacob Wall first sure met, you did. or why they decided to create fake smears against major politicians who they considered to be enemies of Donald Trump. In media appearances, Jacob has given explanations ranging from meeting at pro-Trump events to him being recruited by Jack Berkman due to his investigation skills and business savvy. If cancel culture created an environment where everyone is guilty until proven innocent, then in theory, all they had to do was create a false accusation to ruin someone else's life. It's a tactic that political hatchet men have been using throughout history. For yep. example, the seventh president of the United States, Andrew Jackson, was accused by his political opponents of being the son of a prostitute and a black man. Baseless smear campaigns can be a very effective political tool, but as you'll soon learn, not when wielded by Jacob Wall and Jack Berkman. 
pay close attention because their Robert Mueller smear was as needlessly convoluted as it was sublimely stupid. And so in, um, I believe, the fall of 2018, uh, Jack has teamed up with Jacob. And, and the circumstances here are still a little confusing of how they teamed up. But they team up and uh, they say, we have a woman who was sexually assaulted by Robert Mueller maybe 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, this is going to be a big deal. And at the time, you know, people thought of these guys as kind of like scurrilous characters. But they didn't think of them as like guys who are just have no credibility whatsoever, just completely going to Basically, yes, Deacon. But pretty quickly, this thing starts to fall apart. It began on October 19th, 2018. On that day, Jacob Wall tweeted, spoke to a prominent DC insider today who told me that there are several women prepared to make credible allegations against dirty cop Robert Mueller. Robert Mueller was a former director of the FBI and was appointed as special counsel to a highly publicized investigation of Russian interference in the 2016 election. <sighs> that same day, Jack Berkman posted this video onto his Facebook page. Hey guys, we're here to talk about Robert Mueller and his sexual abuse. And is he an alcoholic? Is he an alcoholic? <laughs> is he a, a day drunk? later, he said that he had witnesses that claimed Robert Mueller is a drunk. He also said that he talked to seven women who claimed to have been harassed by Robert Mueller and that one woman might come forward. He carries around a flask, he carries it and drinks straight booze. Even more serious, it appears that Bob Mueller has uh, really a whole lifetime history of harassing women. We have now talked to seven women who claim to have been harassed by Bob Mueller. Prior to this, a woman named Lorraine Parsons emailed several reporters that a man who claimed to work for Jack oh, Berkman man. offered her $20,000 and a payment of her credit card debt if she agreed to make up accusations of sexual misconduct against Robert Mueller, who she said she worked with at a law firm in 1974. Now, do you remember how I said that this smear was needlessly convoluted? Well, later it turned out that Lorraine Parsons didn't exist. She was a fabrication by Jacob Wall and Jack Berkman. And the reason they did that, who knows? Journalists tried to contact the law firm that she said she worked at, but there was no record that she ever worked there. She said she lived in Fort Myers, Florida, but that also couldn't be corroborated. At the same time, a law professor named Jennifer Taub also received an email from a man named Simon Frick, who claimed to have worked for a firm called Surefire Intelligence. By the way, unlike Lorraine Parsons, Jennifer Taub is actually real. Simon Frick, on the other hand, was not. Yes, um, Simon Frick. The was name of the email was Simon email. Frick, but someone named Jacob Wall has later admitted that he's behind that organization. This other person, um, Lorraine Parsons, no one's really sure if she exists. So what's interesting is the story broke about her because she'd been sending, she or someone using that name, sending this email around to folks and has never been, never been able to be like, contacted. Identified. Right. So it's all, it's all a very strange, strange situation. Anyway, Simon Frick offered her payment to speak about past encounters she might have had with Robert Mueller. Jennifer Taub has never met Robert Mueller. After receiving the email, she reported it to the FBI, and they started an investigation. After I found out about the Lorraine Parsons situation, I began to wonder whether they had reached out to me because I had written an opinion piece about um, about the Brett Kavanaugh hearings and my own personal experience um, with sexual assault. So perhaps they read that and thought, well, she wrote about this, maybe she'll make up stories. The firm, Surefire Intelligence, which Simon Frick said he worked for, was a bogus private intelligence agency made up by Jacob Wall. Um, so the day before the press conference, they say, you know, we had this investigated by this company called Surefire Intelligence. It's like a very like elite, uh, like in the spy service essentially, um, but not quite. Uh, you know, someone called Surefire Intelligence. So he made made up a fake private intelligence agency. The two of these guys. Again, this gets wilder and wilder. His phone number, which went to Jacob's mom's voicemail suggesting that Jacob was in fact behind it. Um, a lot of the pictures of Surefire Intelligence employees were in fact actors and models that he clearly just pulled. It was like Bar Raffaele, like Leonardo DiCaprio's ex-girlfriend. Um, and in fact, the picture of the head of Surefire Intelligence on his LinkedIn, if you brightened it, it was just a picture of Jacob. It was like a very shadowy <laughs> picture, it was just a picture of him. So they clearly- They didn't even bother to hide it that well. Jacob Ball set up Surefire Intelligence as an LLC 
a month before the Mueller smear. But he used it before then to scam people out of petty amounts of money and to pick up girls. Jacob had a history of using the alias Michael Cohen. As Michael Cohen, Jacob presented himself as a 25-year-old Harvard dropout, an ex mossad agent, who was the leader of Surefire Intelligence. Prior to the Mueller smear, Jacob made Craigslist advertisements offering private investigation services through Surefire Intelligence, and some people took the bait. A young woman named Julian Adams found an advertisement on Craigslist for Surefire Intelligence's services and gave Jacob $1,200 to recover her stolen Hummer, which she had lived out of for the previous two years. To Julian, Surefire Intelligence seemed legit. It had a sleek Why? website, an impressive roster of investigators, and there was a medium post about it called Surefire Intelligence, the CIA for hire for the rich and famous. The medium post claimed that Surefire was made up of a staff of ex mossad agents, which included forensic accountants. Why would you hire a private intelligence agency off Craigslist? Why? Former intelligence professionals of various nationalities, cyber specialists, and a translator fluent in eight languages. The article was written by Evan Goldman, who claimed to be an Israeli journalist covering the shadowy world of private intelligence. Unsurprisingly, Evan Goldman did not exist. Evan Goldman was just another example of a fictitious identity created by Jacob Wall. A reverse Google image search showed that his profile picture was stolen from a model named Oren Katan. A Texas oil heiress named Carolyn Cass was also duped by Jacob Wall and Surefire Intelligence. Carolyn had fallen on hard times after being swindled by her trust fund officer and then being scammed out of her inheritance by a social media manager who promised to make her a pop star. After filing a case against the social media manager, she sought out a private investigator. So she looked on Craigslist. There Why? she found Surefire Intelligence and a Why? man named Michael Cohen, which was Jacob Wall's alias. Jacob agreed to collect dirt on the social media manager and charged Carolyn $2,000 for his services. Carolyn pawned the title of her car to pay him. Several weeks later, Jacob informed her that he was going to drop the case as it was too expensive for him to proceed. Despite her disappointment, she didn't complain. Perhaps because by then, the two had already formed a romantic relationship. Uh. They dated for several months. For most of the time that they were together, Carolyn believed that Jacob was Michael Cohen, who was a Harvard dropout and ex mossad agent. On October 30th, 2018, Jack Berkman announced that he'd reveal the first of special counsel Robert Mueller's sexual assault victims at a press conference to be held on November 1st, 2018 at the Rosalind Holiday Inn. On Thursday, high noon, at the Holiday Inn right here in Arlington, Virginia, right behind me, only about a thousand yards that way, we will unveil the first of the sex assault victims of Robert Mueller. Jacob Wall made a similar announcement on his Twitter. By then, many journalists were already onto their ruse. They already discovered Surefire Intelligence's connections to Jacob Wall. Even though everyone knew that they were the ones behind the Robert Mueller smear, Jacob Wall and Jack Berkman denied any wrongdoing and declared that they would still go forward with the press conference. <laughs> The Gateway Pundit, a website that's known for promoting fringe conspiracy theories, interviewed Wall and Berkman and released a video that's since been scrubbed from the internet. During the interview, the duo claimed that their allegations were credible and well vetted. They provided the Gateway Pundit with a document which they said proved the allegations against Robert Mueller, and the document was published onto the site. Hours later, the Gateway Pundit removed the document, recanted the story, and announced that they would investigate Jacob Wall. With Wall and Berkman's smear already debunked before they held a press conference, you'd think that they'd have a great plan up their sleeve to make the whole thing seem legitimate. The answer is no. Instead, they proceeded to mess up even more. The person they chose to pose as Robert Mueller's victim was none other than Caroline Cass. So their brilliant idea was to get a woman whom Jacob is already in a romantic relationship in to claim that Robert Mueller assaulted her. And they thought nobody was going to like vet this at all. I... <sighs> 
Texas oil heiress I spoke about earlier, who was romantically involved with Jacob Wall. One night while speaking to Jacob on the phone, Caroline told him that she'd been date raped by a former employer in a hotel room several years prior. Naturally, Jacob consoled her and thanked her for trusting him enough to share that with him, right? No, no, that's, that's not what he did. No. Instead of doing what someone with a soul would do, Jacob no, used the details of her story to write a script for her to read at the press conference where she would accuse Robert Mueller of sexual assault. Jacob offered her $50,000 to make the false allegation and promised to give her an alias so that her real name would never be mentioned to the press. Moreover, he ensured her that he was in contact with other Mueller victims who were hesitant to come forward. She believed that she would be the catalyst for them to do so and would be hailed as a hero as a result. Before traveling to the press conference, Carolyn Cass saw a story on her newsfeed that was about Wallen Berkman. Still under the impression that his name was Matthew Cohen, she asked him who Jacob Wall was. He then told her that he didn't know. At the airport, a ticketing agent referred to him as Jacob after seeing his ID. She questioned him once again, and he told her that it was just an alias that he was using for the day. She finally realized that Michael Cohen was Jacob Wall after seeing him look at his social media while she pretended to be asleep on the plane. When they landed in Washington, Caroline escaped, booked a flight to New York, and called him to tell him that she wouldn't go through with the press conference. Although Wall and Berkman had promised to bring forward an accuser, they decided to go ahead with the press conference despite not having one. The documentary After Truth, Disinformation and the Cost of Fake News features a segment that follows Wall and Berkman on the day of the press conference. I can't show you clips from it because of copyright, but I'll put the link in the description below. And then they hold the press conference. And, you know, I, I think there are still some people who are, you know, you know, you don't want to come out and say someone, you know, a woman is making up a story about sexual assault. Like that. Um, and so the big question was who this woman was going to be. And so they had kept her identity secret. Um, and then, you know, there were some sort of some flaws already in their, their timeline of when this happened. But they get up there and they don't have their accuser. And I say, well, where's the accuser? <laughs> and they say, well, she got so many death threats, you know, she didn't want to come. And I said, well, none of us know her name. And then, you know, so HBO had a video and HBO had them mic'd up. And then they go down the hall and they say, oh, geez, that's a really good point. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I guess we need to change our lives. Um, so then they, they come up and this thing is just a disaster of a press conference. Um, their accuser doesn't show. She later says that they put her up to it and it's all lies. She had been dating Jacob. It's a very kind of twisted story. Um, yeah, just a Jacob, bit. Oh, God. Uh, they have an affidavit that they release with her name, but it's misspelled throughout. Um, kind of disastrously, Jack's fly is down the whole time during the press conference. Which, <laughs> you know, people are tweeting his flies down, all this stuff, you know. Um, and yeah, it was a big mess. I mean, someone in the crowd yelled, you know, they were like, we'll take one more question and said, someone said, you know, are you ready to go to prison? And I thought, oh, you know. And so they kind of essentially have to flee the, their own press conference. Um, so yeah, that, it, I would say Jacob's first big foray into politics did not go great. After the smear fell apart, Surprisingly, Carolyn Cass became involved in a relationship with Jacob Wall once again. Why? He told her why he. Why? Why would you... why? He lied about his identity, and he never repaid the money he built from her. Despite that, they continued their relationship for the next few months until Jacob dumped her because he didn't want to tell his friends that he was dating a 34-year-old. That's when she decided to tell. What a fucking. What a fucking shit bird. Her story to the press. There's a great article written by Lexi Pandel that goes over Carolyn Cass's story in far more detail. The link is in the description box below. So that's it for part one of this series. In part two, I'll cover Wall and Berkman's several other smears. Believe it or not, things even get crazier, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, check out my Patreon. For only one dollar, you'll get early access to my future videos two yeah, days so that's before part I one, guys. YouTube. To keep tabs on what I'm Part up to. Part two is even Twitter. wilder. I also have an Instagram it really is. and subreddit. Links are in the description box below. That's it for now, and until next time. That's all you need to know now. Yeah, that was that's part one. Um, I know. Part uh, I'll have to go. It, it, no, it gets wilder. Cause guys, we haven't even gotten to the 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 prologue, the opener. Uh, to where they're ac accusing Elizabeth Warren of BDSM, like, sex fantasies roleplay. So... We're, we're, we'll have to do part two tomorrow. 
Uh, but yeah, that's gonna it's gonna be wild. I have I haven't even downloaded a part two. That's why. Yeah, I haven't I haven't downloaded part two. So I'm gonna have to uh, stop here. And I know you guys don't care about my video games, so I'm gonna stop here. But I do want to thank you guys uh, for for watching. Um, but yeah, we'll definitely uh, watch the rest of it tomorrow. It's gonna be it's gonna be fun, I promise. Uh, but yeah, obviously check it out. Uh, check out the channel; it's really awesome. Um, the, it's a really well put together doc. Uh, so, and I apologize for the technical technical issues. Um, hopefully those can get squared away and make sure they don't happen again. But yeah, you guys have a good night and I will see you next time. Oh, the channel is OK, uh, Oki or OKI. Uh, NFCat. Uh, I'm not moving to my gaming channel tonight. I I'm calling it a night to now. Um, but yeah, we'll, uh, I'll be showcasing this on my, uh, gaming channel allegedly. But, alright guys, have a good night, check out my Discord, thank you for all the likes, uh, thank you for all the, 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 the super chats. I'm sorry, I think this guy's more loony than my MyPillow guy. Yeah, oh, definitely. My, the MyPillow guy is kind of a nut job, but yeah, this guy takes the cake. And Nathan, $5, they do these things because they don't think anyone will verify the BS, dazzle them BS, and they'll be too enamored to look at it. I think so, Nathan, but the problem is the reputation has been so unbelievably shit that only the smallest of small, um, like, inner circle people would even, not even most Trumpists would take any of, anything of what they say seriously, especially now. And for those who are also curious, um... They they are face, still facing civil and criminal charges. Those things are still outstanding. It's just that coronavirus has has uh, delayed a lot of the um, the movement. So hopefully this year we'll be uh, hearing more of um, more updates. All right, guys, have a good night. Take care. Bye.